as I've detailed in previous videos, National Socialism is a religion. They adopted pagan runes like the Sieg runes of the SS. The swastika is a holy symbol used by the ancient Indo-European peoples. They styled themselves as Aryans, which comes from the esoteric secret cult of Ariosophy. They also class themselves as Nordics, with Nordic blood. Hitler uses the word providence for God over 500 times in his speeches, and invokes the Almighty and the Lord on other occasions too. They had a race pope, Hans Gunther, who wrote about the Nordic race. They wanted to purify the blood, by which they meant spirit, or the soul. The blood is the spirit, and the spirit is the blood. And I've even mapped out the origins of the ideology from ancient times all the way to the modern era, showing that it was heavily influenced by mysticism from the Orphics, Christianity, Hermeticism, Kant, Theosophy, and so on. But the answer to one question eluded us. Which specific god did Hitler worship? There are entire books written on this, some saying he was a Christian, others say he was a pagan and worshipped a pantheon of gods, others even claim he was a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Tibetan monk, an atheist, or even a Jewish person. However, while arguments could be made for most of these, each of them also had counter evidence that suggested otherwise. Nothing was conclusive. Well, it turns out that all we had to do was go back to the origins of the National Socialist Movement to find our answer. Rudolf Jung was the first National Socialist to write a book on the movement, publishing it in 1919, six years before Mein Kampf, and just prior to Hitler joining the movement. The first edition is hard to get a hold of, but the second edition is available for download at the Internet Archive, and was published in 1922, and that's the version I'm using in this video. Rudolf Jung joined the National Socialist Movement in 1909, which was a decade before Hitler did. His influence on Hitler and the movement was profound with the two of them even appearing together at events, and I've found at least one passage in Mein Kampf which I'm certain Hitler plagiarised from Rudolf Jung. Rudolf Jung not only outlines the very early history of the National Socialist Movement, but he also straight up tells us which god they worshipped. Let us quietly leave the desert god Yahweh, that spirit of destruction, to the Jews. Ours is called the Allfather. I cannot emphasise how important this sentence is. It just cracks open the safe and reveals what's inside. But who is the Allfather? Well, it's Odin. Odin, the one-eyed Allfather. Odin has many names and is the god of both war and death. A solid gold swastika disc is the oldest known reference to Odin of Valhalla, the Norse god of war and death, says archaeologists. And there it is, right there. You can look it up online. There's multiple sources saying that the symbol of the swastika is associated with Odin. We'll come back to confirm this shortly, but before we dive into the evidence linking this to National Socialism, let's just first understand who Odin was. As dramatically retold in the Edaic poem, The Song of the High One, Havamal, Odin sacrificed himself to himself by hanging from the great tree at the centre of the cosmos for nine days and nights, forgoing all food and water, and peering relentlessly downward into the dark waters of the well of fate below, until at last he obtained the object of his ordeal. Just to interject, Hitler invoked fate on many occasions. This was one of the words he used for God, uh, fate, providence, the almighty, and so on. So that's a link there, but let's keep reading. This was the first glimpse of the runes, the jagged Norse alphabet, whose letters were held to symbolize the foremost cosmic forces. The word runes, Old Norse runar, means mysteries as well as letters. To know the runes and their secrets was to be able to wield those cosmic forces. Odin's prize, therefore, was far more than merely an alphabet. So, Odin is the one who discovers the runes, the same runes that the National Socialists are obsessed with, like Guido von Liszt. 
Odin was willing to undergo any trial in order to gain more knowledge of the innermost workings of the universe. That's probably Gnosticism. In the Norse worldview, big picture esoteric knowledge of this sort was seen as being inherently linked to magic. Indeed, the practice of magic was simply putting such lofty understanding to use. To gain this kind of knowledge, therefore, meant to gain colossal power, and power is what Odin was ultimately after. And Odin was also the god of death. One of his particular magical specialities was necromancy. During earlier times, the Roman writers even identified him with Mercury, the Roman god who ferried the spirits of the newly dead to the underworld, rather than Mars, the god of war. Odin is, therefore, primarily the god of death, but also of war, and the swastika is associated with him. Now, I've said before that I couldn't understand why they chose the right-handed version of the swastika rather than the left-handed version. This was a mystery that none of the historians seemed to know, and I couldn't figure it out either. Well, now that we know it's Odin, the god of war and death, it makes perfect sense. In May 1919, Kron wrote a memorandum in which he proposed the left-handed swastika, i.e. clockwise in common with those of the Theosophists and the Germanenorden, as the symbol of the DAP. He evidently preferred the sign in this direction on account of its Buddhistical interpretation as a talisman of fortune and health, whereas its right-handed, i.e. anti-clockwise counterpart, betokened decline and death. Hitler insisted that the National Socialist swastika be right-handed, which would symbolise decline and death. Odin is the god of death, and Rudolf Jung confirms that the National Socialist god is Odin. So it makes perfect sense why Hitler chose the right-handed version of the swastika. It represented his god. The swastika is Odin's symbol. Videla, in his book on National Socialist philosophy, says that the National Socialists made struggle into a law, the law of struggle. He also says that the swastika was the representation of this law of struggle. The great symbol of Nazism was interpreted with the analogy of a world in movement and constant becoming due to the indefatigable nature of life as struggle. The Aryan spirit does not know a perfect world. The world is more like a wheel that turns on itself, symbolised by the swastika. So, the swastika is the symbol of Odin, and also struggle, war, struggle, death. Well, what was Hitler about, right? War, struggle, and death. The amount of times Hitler says the words battle or struggle or both in his speeches and elsewhere is simply ridiculous. Both of these words are synonyms in German. Kampfgruppen, battle group. Panzerkampfwagen, armoured fighting vehicle. Mein Kampf, my struggle, my battle. Battle and struggle are integral to National Socialism, and Hitler says these terms thousands of times in Mein Kampf, his speeches and elsewhere. We'd be here for weeks if we were to read all the quotes, but let's just give a few examples. I would like to thank Providence and the Almighty for choosing me, of all people, to be allowed to wage this battle for Germany. In other words, thank you, Odin, God of War, for allowing me to wage this battle. Elsewhere, our entire struggle is a battle for the soul of our people. It is further a structure, a structure consisting of those minds who are the bearers of our worldview and who will be the foundation of the new state. Struggle is a battle for the soul of the German people whose god is Odin. And perhaps most tellingly, we are not pacifists, for we know that the father of all things is combat and struggle. The father, the all-father, Odin, is combat and struggle. Odin is about war and death. That's why they're not pacifists. Here it is. You, you couldn't make this any clearer. Now, this particular quote is otherwise attributed to the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who said that change is the father of all things. And there's definitely a link there. 
But change is also Hegel's Aufheben, which Videl has said before means a world of movement and constant becoming. Aufheben and change is struggle and revolution. Hitler, of course, was all about struggle and revolution, so it's all tied together with him, but also Odin. Just to point out, in a previous video on the timeline of these ideologies, I said that there didn't appear to be a connection between Hegel and Hitler. I can now confirm that Helena Blavatsky did read Hegel, so that's where the connection is. I also suspect some of the other early National Socialists like Guido von Liszt probably read Hegel too, but I can't yet confirm that. But regardless, there is a connection between Hegel and Hitler via Blavatsky. And now we've identified Odin as the god behind National Socialism, we can see more evidence of his influence. I should point out that I've independently come to this conclusion after reading Rudolf Jung and doing my own research for previous videos, but I'm not the first to make this connection. There is a book titled The Return of Odin by Rudgely, which makes a similar case. I've only just discovered this book because I've only made the connection of few days ago myself, so I've not had time to read it in full. Skimming through it though, it doesn't appear that he's made the connection that I have regarding Rudolf Jung, but he does say that the god behind the National Socialist movement was Odin, and one of the things he mentions is this. In Norse mythology, the whole cosmos is generated out of the interaction between the two opposite principles of fire and ice. On one side we have Niflheim, the dark world, an icy realm of the far north, and on the other we have Muspelsheimer, the fiery realm of the far south. Two primal forces in polar opposition separated from one another by the void of um, guinea pig. It is when these two forces combine that the entire cosmos is generated. Well, what did Hitler believe in? Welt Eis Lira. World Ice Theory. This idea has roots in Blavatsky's writings, goes through Guido von Liszt and lands on Liebenfels until it reaches Hitler and the National Socialists. But in Western philosophy, this idea ultimately derives from the ancient Greeks. Thales and Heraclitus posited that the world stuff that made up everything was made of water. And frozen water is ice. But obviously, it's clearly present in Norse mythology too. Himmler believed in the same idea and told Ernst Schaefer this, the guy who went to Tibet in 1939 to search for Aryan origins there. The Aryan race, Himmler believed, had descended directly and fully formed from heaven. Races of giants had once roamed the earth. The universe had been formed from a cosmic battle between fire and ice. Schaefer told his interrogators that he had thought such ideas were absurd, laughable. They, the SS leadership, all believed in world ice theory. That is naturally entirely unscientific, but the men read no other books. It is such a fantastic story that one can hardly believe it. They all tended to the occult perspective. Indeed, along with Heinrich Himmler, one of the most powerful Nazis in charge of the SS, who took a liking to the ice world thinking, Adolf Hitler himself became a big proponent of World Ice Lira. In fact, Hitler planned to build a planetarium in Linz where a whole floor would be dedicated to Horbiger's theory. He is also known to have suggested that the World Ice Theory could one day replace Christianity. The Welt Eis Lira provided an Aryan alternative to the dreadful and mistaken Jewish theories of scientists like Einstein. Invented by the Austrian scientist and philosopher Hans Horbiger, World Ice Theory was inspired by a dream in which Horbiger found himself floating in space, observing a giant pendulum swinging back and forth, growing ever longer and eventually breaking. When he woke, Horbiger claimed to know intuitively that the sun's gravitational pull ceased to exert any force at three times the distance of Neptune, and that most of the physical universe could be explained through the interplay of the antagonistic Earth substances of ice and fire. 
According to Horbiger, the prime matter of the universe was ice. Cosmic ice threaded its way through the cosmos. The Milky Way and every planetary body, with the exception of the Earth, was sheathed in ice. But this cosmic frost waged perpetual war with gigantic fiery suns. Every body in the universe was drawn into the perpetual struggle between fire and ice, and new planets were formed from the debris of catastrophe and collision. Bigger, more powerful bodies like the Earth ensnared smaller moons in ever-decreasing orbital cycles, and the eventual collisions generated floods, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. According to Horbiger, Mond Niederbrucker, Moon Breakdown, explained the extinction of the dinosaurs, the biblical flood, and the destruction of Atlantis. The few survivors fled to form asylum or refuge cultures in Mexico and South America. I tend to support world ice theory, Hitler declared in 1942. Horbiger's theory was convincing, the Führer suggested, in proving that icy moons had crashed into Earth, creating geophysical forces that caused a flood from which only a few humans had survived. In all the human traditions, Hitler continued, one finds mention of a huge cosmic disaster. In the Nordic legend, we read of a struggle between giants and gods. In my view, the thing is explicable only based on the hypothesis of a disaster that completely destroyed a humanity which already possessed a high degree of civilization. And probably related to this idea, Hitler also said... All that's left is to prove that in nature there is no frontier between the organic and the inorganic. When understanding of the universe has become widespread, when the majority of men know that the stars are not sources of light, but worlds, perhaps inhabited worlds like ours, then the Christian doctrine will be convicted of absurdity. He says there's no frontier between the organic matter and the organic spirit. We are one with God? But yes, the fact that Hitler subscribed to world ice theory suggests that he was a believer in Norse mythology, which means, given all the other evidence, he believed in Odin. If he didn't believe in Odin, why on earth would he subscribe to such a stupid theory? So this is further evidence linking Hitler to Odin. And it turns out that I'm not the first to make this connection. So far, the seemingly independent reports of Odin's return by the psychologist Carl Jung and the sociologist Dennis Duclos have been followed and found to be inextricably linked. Jung's identification of Odin as the hidden unconscious force behind the Nazi movement and Duclos' notion that the mad warrior of northern myth embodied by Odin is the shadowy inspiration for an epidemic of violence seem to meet on the common ground of right-wing extremism in the United States. There is a growing pagan movement in the New World that includes a number of Odinic cults. Many individuals on the far right have cast off their Christian identity and turned back towards the heathen gods. Carl Jung was a hermeticist himself, so perhaps his input is relevant here. But if we may forget for a moment that we are living in the year of our Lord, 1936, and laying aside our well-meaning all-too-human reasonableness, may burden God or the gods with the responsibility for contemporary events instead of man, we would find Wotan, another name for Odin, quite suitable as a causal hypothesis. In fact, I venture the heretical suggestion that the unfathomable depths of Wotan's character explain more of National Socialism than all three reasonable factors put together. There is no doubt that each of these factors explains an important aspect of what is going on in Germany. But Wotan explains yet more. He is particularly enlightening in regard to a general phenomenon which is so strange to anybody not a German that it remains incomprehensible, even after the deepest reflection. I'm not sure how exactly Carl Jung came to this revelation about the National Socialists. Perhaps he communicated with the Demiurge? Um, but it is possible to be right for the wrong reasons, and Jung's point that it explains a lot about what went on in Germany is correct. To add to this, even modern journalists are saying that Odin is the god of the neo-Nazis. 
a racist brand of neo-paganism related to Odinism spreads among white supremacists. Odinism, which is closely related to Asatru, was much favoured in Nazi Germany. Its Nordic Teutonic mythology was a bedrock belief for key Third Reich leaders, and it was an integral part of the initiation rites and cosmology of the elite Schutzstaffel SS, which supervised Adolf Hitler's network of death camps. Decades later, Odinism also influenced George Lincoln Rockwell's American Nazi Party. And it's not just journalists, but historians too. James Greger describes neo-Nazi Julius Evola's fascination for the primordial creative race of Hyperborea, a celestial race. This is further substantiated by Goodrich Clark in the book Black Sun, where he describes Evola's view that the German god Wotan, or Odin, was going about granting victory. Evola's northern bias led him to regard the German peoples as a powerful, countervailing force to Christianity's female culture. As descendants of the northern Aryan racial stocks, the Germans had preserved their prehistoric purity outside the cosmopolitan late Roman Empire. Their Norse myths and tribal ethos preserved traces of the primordial tradition. The god Wotan Odin granted victory, possessed esoteric knowledge, and had secrets not granted to any woman. He was the leader of the dead heroes. The oldest Nordic stocks regarded Asgard in the far north as the home of the gods, an ancestral memory that linked them with the Indo-Aryans in the east. Goodrich Clark also talks about other National Socialists and Neo-Nazis who have an obsession with Odin, including the Norwegian Varj Vikernes. While in jail, Vikernes began to formulate his nationalist heathen ideology using materials from Norse mythology combined with racism and occult National Socialism. These essays were published in various underground publications and in Philosophium, a neo-Nazi magazine published by Vidar van Herxer, another member of Burzum, who had migrated to France. Vikernes' articles typically revolved around esoteric interpretations of myths in the Edda, with discussions of Odin, his magical ring, ravens and wolves. Vikernes identified himself with Wotan or Odin. I am his flesh and blood, his soul and spirit, for I am his posterity, and the archetypes in our race are his. Other articles focused on Norse cosmology and magical practices. Later in the book, Goodrich Clark states, Odinism today represents the battlefront of racist paganism in support of a white Aryan revolutionary path in the United States with associated branches and chapters in Europe, South Africa and Australia. Its devotees practice imaginative forms of ritual magic and ceremonial forms of fraternal fellowship based on Norse and Germanic models while embracing the ideals of white supremacism and national socialism. In this chapter, we will trace the German origins and history of Odinism in the English-speaking world before focusing on several examples of the movement. Wyatt Kaldenberg and his Pagan Revival Network, which focuses on Odin's warrior aspect and advocates a cult of violence, Jost Turner and his NS Kindred, which celebrates Odin as a master of mysteries in a devotional cult of Aryan mysticism with meditation and yoga, and the Wotansfolk movement of David and Katja Lane with Ron McVan, which elaborates a full-blown Wotanist cult for the millenarian salvation of the endangered Aryan race. So there is a clear connection here. But now that we've identified it, it becomes even more obvious why Odin must be Hitler's god. Hitler admired Richard Wagner's music, whom he mentions a few times in his speeches, the table talks, and in Mein Kampf, where he refers to him as the Beirut master, and says he was drawn time and time again to his operas. Well, Richard Wagner was all about German and Norse mythology, the twilight of the gods, and Wotan, Odin, is obviously in there too, such as in Das Rheingold. 
Hitler's passion for Wagner knew no bounds. A performance could affect him almost like a religious experience, plunging him into deep and mystical fantasies. Wagner amounted for him to the supreme artistic genius, the model to be emulated. Later, Ian Kershaw writes, For Hitler, Wagner was more than the music alone. When I hear Wagner, Hitler himself, much later recounted, it seems to me that I hear rhythms of a bygone world. It was a world of Germanic myth, of great drama and wondrous spectacle, of gods and heroes, of titanic struggle and redemption, of victory and of death. It was a world where the heroes were outsiders who challenged the old order, like Rienzi, Tannhauser, Stolzing and Siegfried, or chaste saviors like Lohengrin and Parsifal. Betrayal, sacrifice, redemption, and heroic death were Wagnerian themes which would also preoccupy Hitler down to the Gotterdammerung, Twilight of the Gods, of his regime in 1945. And it was a world created with grandiose vision by an artist of genius, an outsider and revolutionary, all or nothing refuser of compromise, challenger of the existing order, dismissive of the need to bow to the bourgeois ethic of working for a living, surmounting rejection and persecution, overcoming adversity to attain greatness. It was little wonder that the fantasist and dropout, the rejected and unrecognised artistic genius in the dingy room in the Stuppergasse could find his idol in the master of Beirut. Hitler, the non-entity, the mediocrity, the failure, wanted to live like a Wagnerian hero. He wanted to become himself a new Wagner, the philosopher king, the genius, the supreme artist. Hitler's obsession with Wagner doesn't directly link him to Odin specifically, but it does link him to the Nordic myths, of which Odin was the highest and greatest. So at the very least, it's another piece in the puzzle. And interestingly, another of Hitler's idols, Houston Stuart Chamberlain, married Wagner's daughter and was obsessed with Wagner as well. Houston Stuart Chamberlain was one of Hitler's mentors, and Hitler drew heavily from his works. And in the Germanenorden of the Volkischer societies, where the National Socialist Swastika was first adopted, this was the process for introducing new members to the cult. The ceremony began with soft harmonium music, while the brothers sang the Pilgrim's Chorus from Wagner's Tannhauser. The ritual commenced in candlelight, with brothers making the sign of the swastika, and the master reciprocating. Then the blindfold novices, clad in pilgrimage mantles, were ushered by the master of ceremonies into the room. Here the master told them of the order's aereo germanic and aristocratic Weltanschauung, before the bard lit the sacred flame in the grove, and the novices were divested of their mantles and blindfolds. At this point, the master seized Wotan's spear and held it before him while the two knights crossed their swords upon it. A series of calls and responses, accompanied by music from Lohengrin, completed the oath of the novices. Their consecration followed with cries from the forest elves, the choir, as the new brothers were led into the grove of the grail around the bard's sacred flame. With the ritual personifying lodge officers as archetypal figures in Germanic mythology, this ceremonial must have exercised a potent influence on the candidates. So even the origins of the National Socialist Movement are awash with Odinism. Hitler says that the term Sieg Heil is the battle cry and sacred vow from the German Volk and the National Socialist Movement. But why? Let us join the other Germans throughout the Reich who, at this moment, express our love, our dedication, our willingness to sacrifice, our faith, our loyalty, and our confidence in the battle cry, our Volk and our German Reich, Sieg Heil. Another time... 
And I would like to ask you to join me once again in uttering the battle cry for what means most to us in this world, for which we once fought and struggled and triumphed, which we did not forget in the time of defeat, which we loved in the time of need, which we adored in the time of disgrace, and which is sacred and dear to us now in the time of victories. Our German Reich, our German Volk, and our one and only National Socialist Movement. Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. And another time, and thus I ask of you, renew on this day of the greatest and most glorious demonstration in the world, your vow to your Volk, to our community, and to our National Socialist State. My will, and this must be the vow of each and every one of us, is your faith. To me as to you, my faith is everything I have in this world, but the greatest thing God has given me in this world is my Volk. In it rests my faith, it I serve with my will, and to it I give my life. May this be our mutual sacred vow on the day of German labour, which so rightfully is the day of the German nation, to our working German Volk. Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. Okay, but what does Sieg Heil actually mean? Well, I need to point out that the runes that the National Socialists were using were pseudo-runes, not real runes, invented by Guido von Liszt. So their exact meaning may be different to the real Norse runes. And in the Guido von Liszt and National Socialist case, the Sieg rune, the Lightning S, two of which would later be used to represent the SS, means victory. And in the National Socialist sense, it's also linked with the rune Tyre, which is an upward arrow symbol. Tyre is the Norse god of war, portrayed as the one-handed warrior. Tyre's symbol is the sword. Once he played a very important role in the Germanic pantheon. Tuesday is actually Tyre's day. Anglo-Saxons called him Tu. By the Viking Age, Tyre was somewhat overshadowed by Thor and Odin. In Nazi Germany, the Tyre rune was also known as the Kampf rune, battle rune, or the Pfeil rune, arrow rune, and was symbolic of leadership in battle. I will just interject to say that battle also means struggle, as we discussed before, so the Tyre rune is the rune for battle and struggle, two concepts central to National Socialism. It was widely used by various young people organizations after World War I, and later by the Hitler Jungen and the SA. Worn on the upper left arm, it indicated the graduation from the SA Reichsfuhrer School. It was also used as the badge of the SS Recruiting and Training Department, as well as the emblem of the Waffen SS Division, 30th of January. The Tyre rune also marked the graves of the SS, thus replacing the Christian cross. Well, now we move on to the Sieg rune. Zig is the Armenian name of that rune. In the ancient Norse and Germanic rune lore, that rune always designated the sun. Its elder Futhark reconstructed name is Sovilo, sun. Younger Futhark name is Sol, sun. Anglo-Saxon Futhark name is Siegel, sun. Guido von Liszt changed the name to mean victory, Sieg in German. And this next sentence is vitally important. The sequence of runes, Sieg and Tyre, in this version of the Futhark, together constitute Siegtyre, one of Odin's names. So Siegtyre is one of Odin's names. Victory and struggle is one of Odin's names. Hmm... In Nazi Germany, Sieg or Sieg's rune, rune of victory, was the most recognisable and popular symbol after the Hakenkreuz, swastika. SS runes insignia with two oblique Sieg runes were created in 1933 by graphic designer Walter Heck. He got 2.50 Reichsmarks for the rights to this design. Nazi Sieg's runes actually have nothing to do with the ancient sun symbolism of the so Velo rune, the earliest E forms of which substantially differ from later versions. So there you go. Odin, god of war and death, was the one who created the runes. Sieg is the von List rune for victory, and Tyre is the von List rune for battle. 
Tsiltaya is the National Socialist rune word for one of Odin's names and means victory in battle, and sounds very similar to Si Heil as well. The concepts of victory in battle and Odin are therefore entwined. Hitler himself says that Sieg Heil, which is the hail to victory and associated with Odin, is the battle cry and sacred vow of the German folk and the National Socialist movement. And as mentioned before, Julius Evola's view was that the German god Odin was going about granting victory because he was the god of war. So it seems very likely that what they're actually doing when they are saying Sieg Heil is hailing Odin, or at least invoking him by calling for victory from the god of war and death. You have been chosen by Fortune. Fortune has a capital letter because he means god. You have been chosen by Fortune. You have joined the right flag, Odin Swastika. And you shall stand by this flag as the old guard of the National Socialist Revolution. Long live our National Socialist Germany. Long live our Volk. And may today the dead of our movement, Germany and its men, living and dead, live on. Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. So he's calling on God, Fortune. He's invoking Odin's swastika. He's calling on the dead to live on and hailing victory from the god of both war and death. And, you know, now we know it's Odin, we can see why he's saying this stuff. It's not random. He is invoking Odin here. Odin's favoured warriors were always the elite ones, and this same preference of his extended to all other realms of life. Those who claimed Odin as their patron were, like Odin himself, always elite and exceptional in some way or another. Since he was the ruler of the gods, he was a natural choice for the patron of human kings and chieftains. But Odin was the antithesis of a law and order type of ruler like the god Tyre. Instead, he was a terrible sovereign who governed by raw power often of a magical nature. We can see parallels to Hitler here. This is a bit of speculation here, but let's think about this. Odin was the antithesis of Tyre. So what that means is the thesis is Sieg Odin, the antithesis is Tyre, and so the synthesis is Sieg Tyre. Hmm... Is this a hint of the Hegelian influence here? A National Socialist Alfhaven, perhaps? I don't know, but I just wanted to point this out on the off chance that this is what was going on. Some other parallels that may be worth pointing out. McCoy in the book The Viking Spirit says that Odin is the most complex and contradictory of the Norse gods. Again, there's that Alfhaven idea of contradictions. Odin's name literally means the inspired one, the ecstatic one, and the furious one, all of which sound very similar to Hitler. Odin is associated with war and boasts in one Eddic poem, I incited the princes never to make peace, which could go some way to explaining why Hitler never made peace either. Obviously, some of the latter stuff I've just mentioned is up for debate, but I do think that there's enough evidence to confirm that Odin is Hitler's god. Odin is the god of National Socialism, which is a cult. But because Rudolf Jung was all but forgotten and ignored by the historical community, very few historians seem to have read his work or made this connection. So the evidence in favour of National Socialism being an Odin cult was a little hard to prove till this point. But since Rudolf Jung states it as fact, confirming that Odin is their god, and we have evidence elsewhere showing this too, we can see that this conclusion is the correct one to make. And Rudolf Jung also provides us with more information that helps confirm that National Socialism is a religion and why it is the way it is, but I'll save that for another time. I want to do a video dedicated to looking at Rudolf Jung himself, his history of the National Socialist movement, and his influence on Hitler. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of that. That actually was the original plan for this video before I realised that 
I just had to make a video on the Nazi Odin connection first. I also intend to do a video refuting the idea that Hitler was a Christian, a Muslim, or an atheist, none of which really makes sense if you actually look at the evidence. But again, that's for another time. So, in summary, Rudolf Jung confirms that Odin was Hitler's god. National Socialism is an esoteric religious cult that has a pagan symbol at the heart of its flag, drowns itself in pagan runes, and throws out hails to victory from their war god, Odin. Its leaders believe in the Norse myth of the universe being created by ice and fire, and neo-Nazis are also obsessed with this god as well. Very interested to hear what you guys think about all this, so let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.